Welcome to the No Name MMA Show. Hello, everyone. This is the No Name MMA Show, the damn MMA podcast you've never heard of. My name is Andy Romero, and my guest for today, you might recognize him by calling the fights, which he is returning to a live audience in a long, long time this weekend's fights in Austin. Also, his podcast, Fitz Nation, where he interviews fighters about their life. I am talking about Brendan Fitzgerald. Thank you for giving me the pleasure to talk to you today. Hey, good to talk to you, Andy. Uh, pleasure to be on. How are you doing? How, what, how, since when have you known that you were going to be calling the Austin card? This was an audible. I was not supposed to be calling this card, actually. Um, my, my original schedule for the summer was to not call a show on the road until August. Oh, snap. But, um, you know, I was supposed to do the June 4th car, Apex, but I uh, just had a baby boy. My wife and I welcomed our baby boy on May 23rd. Oh, snap. So, Congratulations. Uh, yeah, thank you. So shortly before then, we kind of, it was a little early. Like, the original due date was mid-June, but we just knew we pulled off the 6-4 show. And uh, I was just like, I can fill in for for Annika in Austin just because he then had to call this June 4th and then go to Singapore. And, you know, it's a whirlwind for him uh, on those back-to-back weeks to make it three in a row would have been a little much. And, you know, for me, it was a good time at home. I've been at home for like a month. And then to get the opportunity to go to Austin where I called the show back in 2018. It was one of my first UFC shows. And not to mention the card we have this weekend is um, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a little mini pay per view. If you really look at it, you're. Really good, yeah. I mean you you could possibly be looking at one of the last performances for Donald Cerrone in his long and storied career. I mean that alone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, is just insane. Um, so how long has it been since you've called a card with a like a live audience in like a stadium? In an arena with a crowd, the last one I did was in Norfolk, Virginia, in the 20s, February 29th. It's the only show in UFC history that happened on a leap day. And to bring people back, that is when Joe Benavidez fought Davis and Figueredo for the title the first time. Oh, God. And uh, Figueredo missed weight, so he was ineligible to win the title, and then he won. Um, So that was the first one. The pandemic was, you know, raging overseas, and... We, I was in Brazil the weekend that the pandemic truly started and we went with no crowd and that was at a big arena in Brazil. But in terms of having a crowd and life as quote unquote normal, it was February of 2020. So it's been more than two years. Are you looking forward to being back with a crowd now? Or or are you accustomed to having the cushy apex like, oh, okay, going back at it again? No, I am. Uh, I am thrilled to get on the road. You know, like, um it'll be it's a different thing with the family and like a newborn at home so my wife is like glad that i get to go have fun and and do this show on the road because she knows i've been waiting to kind of have feel that energy um and you know really it's beyond just the crowd the crowd is great the energy the show is going to be amazing the card is awesome but when the shows are at the apex um i don't even really get to like have a dinner with our crew because people are com- people are either at home in Las Vegas or just living their normal life. It's become like an office job where um, you're, you, know, you're... you kind of clock in, you go to work at the Apex. When, you're, when your show is done, you go home to the wife and kids and everybody kind of scatters and does their own thing. And the people that are there from out of town, um, you know, will gather for dinner and stuff like that. And I've done that a little bit here this year. But, um, you know, really the camaraderie of everybody you work with. And then I'm so excited to be staying at the same hotel as the fighters again. So to run into the fighters that are fighting this weekend in the lobby, to run into their coaches that I've come to get to know, teammates that are in the UFC in their corner that I can just connect with on the road. Like that's where a lot of my relationships come from to the point where I can have them on my podcast and feel good about talking to them. And that's just been absent for more than two years. And so, uh, really, it's it's the thing surrounding the crowd in the arena um, and the the night of the fights is just 
as important to me and I'm looking just as forward to that than I am the crowd. That's dope. Um, Speaking of your relationship with the fighters, I feel that every time I listen to your podcast, it's almost like a foregone conclusion that you're best friends with every fighter that you're talking to. <laughs> um, I, I was just uh, listening to your Alexis Harris interview. And so I, I figured out two things from you. So first, you don't smoke weed. <laughs> And no, that's, that's, a, that's from yesterday. That's or that's from uh, you know college was the experimental time and all that stuff. And, uh, the kind of phase of my life is over. Also, I didn't know. I mean, this isn't common knowledge, and I I don't know why I would know this. But you're vegan. How long have you been vegan for? Yeah, I mean, vegan is the easiest way to describe it. I would say I eat a vegan diet. Um, you know, vegan means different things to different people. Like John Gooden is a vegan where like he won't wear a leather belt or leather shoes or anything like that. Gotcha. Very cruelty free lifestyle. I mean, I vegan is the easiest way to put it because most people translate it to food. But anyways, yeah, I eat a vegan diet and I've been doing that since right before the pandemic started. Really fall of 2019 is when I kind of started just more and more uh like not eating meat and then like on the road i'd be like well i'll have a steak on the road and then i'd go on the road to a steakhouse and have a steak and you know whatever yeah. um but eat a vegan diet at home and then like more and more i was just like well i don't really like it when i eat the steak on the road like i don't feel as good i, I i'm kind of liking this way of eating so like i didn't get into it because of some eureka moment like i have to do this it was like let me just try to get a little healthier, have a few days where I don't eat red meat, you know, or, you know, try it out. Right. And sure enough, like I started liking the no meat days better than the days that I had meat. And uh, like I told Alex in the interview, like I wasn't just like, I'll have a steak for dinner and whatever. I'd have, you know, animal products and meat like breakfast, lunch and dinner, like every single day. And I was shocked as anybody that it kind of stuck with me and uh here i am like more than two years later still going strong it's not like i won't have a bite of pizza if there's like some yeah. mozzarella cheese on it or whatever but uh you know and like i'll have an in and out burger like once or maybe twice a year type of thing gotcha. but it's not enough where i want to keep going with it and you know there's no police that's telling me what to do and all that stuff but yeah it's been a couple of years it's it's kind of crazy i mean honestly i'm as surprised as anybody else i, I, I promise you and yeah, I just, for me, I, whenever you start to really look at what products have animal byproducts in it, it's almost everything. So <laughs> veganism to me, I, in terms of the most extreme wearing animal products, like that just wouldn't work. And I just like meat and cheese too much. But also I am vegetarian in some aspects where I can just go and eat beans and rice and cheese for like forever. If for yeah. every meal, if possible. Um, what got you into interviewing fighters? Like what, what, what clicked when you were like, Hey, like nobody's really talking to these people. Like they're actual people. Like everybody just talks about the fights, what's coming up, how your preparation is, what your camp is like, but you're like diving in and just talking about like, I mean, very tough subjects with fighters. What kind of clicked for you and made you go like, yeah, I want to talk to these guys and see what's going on. Well, before I started working for the UFC, I was at ESPN, and ESPN uh, had this this guy who used to work for them. He doesn't work there anymore, and he was getting older, but I think he got laid off a few years after I did. But he did a three-day seminar where he taught interviewing. Mm -hmm. It was all about interviewing. It was nine to five in a conference room for three full days. Oh, snap about interviewing and uh, you know a lot of people i think would think geez that sounds like the most boring three days of the year you know you're sitting in yeah. room and just kind of you know it's not your day-to-day -day and, and all these different things and i was just like um i didn't really know what to expect going into it but at the end of those three days what he showed us and kind of how he broke down the art of interviewing was so fascinating to me that i didn't really know how much i enjoyed it in terms of like listening to that sort of content but then i'm like well i do like good podcasts that feature kind of storytelling in interview form and whenever you have a 
really good documentary or a good live interview on TV with a with a you know cultural figure, it's like very interesting. And so I immediately was just like, I want to start doing this because my job um, in the past had included interviewing because I worked at local news stations. Mm -hmm. So that's like going out and getting sound bites. You know, you go into a locker room and what are you doing? I mean, you're interviewing. It's a weird form when there's 10 guys standing around a football player with his shirt off in the locker room after a game. Right. But you are asking a question to try to get information or an opinion or an answer that's people want to watch as content. And, uh, and then, like, I, I, I realized, like, I had done a lot of interviewing in that form over the years, and I just completely clueless, had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> like, I, I feel like I feel like that three days at ESPN when I learned how to interview um, was, like, I feel like until that point, I didn't understand being on television. And I was, like, oh, eight snap. years into my career at that point. You know, I was, like, seven or eight years, and I had covered World Series. I had covered... Stanley Cup Finals. I'd been to a Super Bowl. Worked in Boston for a few years. Like I had done, and I had even been at ESPN for a year at that point. And I feel like those three days was probably more important than my entire four-year college education in terms of understanding television, content, journalism, interviewing techniques, uh, hosting techniques, so many things. And it was just such a kind of coming to Jesus moment. And Part of it was I don't do any interviewing in my job at ESPN right? because I was like a studio host. I did highlights and I worked with analysts on the desk and that sort of stuff. I was able to apply some of the concepts that I learned. But when I started working for the UFC, um, and then really it took like a year and a half to like kind of get into the flow and see how the UFC works. But then I pitched to my boss. I said, hey, I'd, I'd love to start interviewing some of these fighters, you know, just whether, you know, start yeah. an interview project. And they agreed to it in terms of some of the one-off interviews where we use, you know, uh, like a great crew. Like, you know, I interviewed Bryce Mitchell in Nashville in 2019. Yeah. And even on YouTube, you can find my long interview with Brian Ortega and Holly Holm and some of those and, and Uriah Faber. And some of those, those are like UFC support interviews. And that was cool. But I realized that was only going to happen once every few months right. when it made sense production wise and what cards I was calling and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I said, you know what, I'm just going to start this on my own too. Uh, I'm going to buy, you know, I'm going to keep it as simple as possible. It was audio only. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, just started it in like April of 2019. And immediately, like, because of that course at ESPN that I took, like I wanted real interviews or, you know, not real interviews. Like I mm -hmm. wanted deep dive content. Right. And part of that course was learning, you can go surface level and touch on a lot of things, or you can go very narrow and go 10 feet deep. Gotcha. You know, instead of trying to, you know, wade in the pool deep and cover 15 subjects with somebody over the course of 20 minutes, mm -hmm. cover their life, talk about their life. And there's, of course, in an hour going to be things that you don't get to. Nobody can tell their life story in an hour. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of go chronologically from when they were young to when they're older to what got them into MMA and fighting. And sometimes we don't really talk about fighting that much. And, uh, you know, it's to me, it's just so compelling to get to know who they are as people, because really, we're a bunch of people walking around. We're not fighters. We're not bankers. We're not stockbrokers or people that do other things. And with fighters, I just saw it as like an opportunity. Really, when I started doing it, I was just like, these guys do so many interviews, but none of the interviews sound like the ones that I want to do. Right. So I'm going to give it a shot. And uh, it's taken longer than I thought for people to notice. And even still, I'm still kind of like, gosh, I'm surprised my show is more out there in terms of like a lot of people still tell me, they're just like, I didn't know you had a podcast. And I'm like, oh, well, it's pretty good. But it's not clickbait. You know, it's right. not like... It's not news of the day. It's not getting somebody's. I said it in my first episode. You listen to the first five minutes of the first episode. I'm just like, this is not going to be what fighters think of Conor McGregor. Right. Because that is the easy way to get clicks and views and whatever. Yeah, exactly. And there's no harm in that. I get the business of it. But I was just like, I don't want that to be my show. And it's not going to be my show. And we're going to talk about these fighters and we're going to really get to know them as people. So it's a little different in that. You know, if you're not into hearing about James Krause, then you're probably not going to listen to that episode. Right. Um, but if you are into getting to know the fighters, then there's no better show. I mean, it truly is a fresh take because 
again, you're right. Every interview that you hear with the fighter is like, did you anticipate this? Like, like, how are you going to address so, this yeah, from an like, opponent? Are, like, in, you know, like right away, that question is like, I get shot down at ESPN. Like, did you anticipate this? What are they yeah. going to say? Yes or no? Right. Like, stay away from the yes or no questions. Mm-hmm. The other big thing is like, follow up. When they say something interesting, follow up. Alex Caceres was talking about how he had like a rough childhood, dealt with a lot of stuff. Yeah. And a lot of people just move on from that. If he says, I dealt with a lot of stuff, I had a tough childhood, then you say, like what? <laughs> yeah, no. rocket science. You just kind of stay curious and dig a little deeper, and that's when you get those big stories. It's not. It's not about asking tough questions in terms of saying the buzzwords. Right. It's about staying curious, and when they say something interesting, keep asking them about it. And you might stay on that subject for ten minutes, and you might have to throw some story that you wanted to get about their fight off the table because you run out of time. But that ten minutes is going to be really interesting, very unique, very original, and something that nobody else has. I mean that that could not have been said better. Uh now on to my clickbaity question. <laughs> sure. Um so recently Chel Sonnen asked for the help of John Anik commentating for Eagle FC saying, "Hey, we're sitting down for 6 to 7 hours at a time. What do you do in regards to going to the bathroom? Since I have only a little bit of time left with you, what what do you do? Is it like a NASCAR pit situation where like <laughs> Yeah, like it's it's interesting. I I've played with different scenarios in terms of what I try to do before the show. Obviously, like I, I mean, in a best case scenario, I don't have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> um, but it's kind of you know, like you can just go six hours and not go, and then right. like okay, cool. But then what are you doing? Like, are you hydrated? Because yeah. if you're not hydrated, then your voice is going to scratch a little easier and not going to sound as good. And so I've really just like attacked different things. If the hotel has a sauna, I've been like, let me drink a hundred ounces of water, like before noon. But and then, so then I'm going to the bathroom, like for the early afternoon, sit in the sauna and then still be kind of like my body's hydrated, but not have to go. I've tried like just drinking a ton of water during just being like, screw it. I'm going to need two bathroom breaks. (laughs) There is no correct answer, but Really what it is, is um, the best way to do it is when we take a commercial break on fighter walks, that commercial break is usually like three minutes long. Sometimes they're three and a half minutes long. And uh, you just have to kind of communicate with your producer. And it's a lot easier when there's a three-man booth. So like this weekend, I'm working with Dom Cruz in D.C. If I go to the bathroom during fighter walks, that's two guys that kind of bounce back and forth. And we're in commercial break for the U.S. audience on ESPN. So to you at home watching on ESPN or ESPN Plus, if we're on commercial break, you didn't even know I was gone. Gotcha. Um, and so that's usually how that works. And, you know, depending on in an arena, it's a little different because you got to scoot. You know, you're sitting in the middle of the arena floor. Yeah. You got you to gotta kind of run. In the apex, it's a little easier because uh, it's not as big of a place and kind of know our way around it a lot better. But, yeah, you, you definitely have to scout it beforehand. <laughs> and then you gotta pick us for Make sure you know where the like, exits are at. And like, you know, sometimes you just gotta hold it. Like I've you know, sometimes you know, we've had a lot of decisions, so then you don't have time to kill. Oh. The best is when you get a lot of finishes early. You get that and, early knockout. Well, if you get some early knockouts and then we use the desk, you know, you know, sometimes we do those desk fill segments where it's yeah. like, all right, we've had three first round finishes in a row coming up next. Karen and the crew are gonna walk you through some of the highlights, then we got like six, seven minutes, then it's easy. So gotcha. those that's the best case scenario, but you can never rely on that. Especially this weekend, we got eight prelims and a six fight main card. So eight fights to fit in three hours. Like very unlikely we use our desk crew during the prelims. And uh, you know, I don't know how I'm gonna attack it this weekend. But I'll see. We'll see. <laughs> well, it's good to hear from you. Congratulations on your baby. Thank you for your time talking to us. And uh yeah, so for everybody out there, make sure you check out. Brendan Fitzgerald's podcast, Fitz Nation, on YouTube. Sound, uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, YouTube, what else is it available on? Sorry. Oh, yeah. So we got YouTube. The, the exclusive full interviews are now on Fight Pass. Gotcha. They're now on UFC Fight Pass, but there's a YouTube version. It's just a little shorter. My audio version is just a little shorter. It's the same as the YouTube version. Um, there's just some exclusive content as part of Fight Pass. But the good thing about it being on Fight Pass is that uh, way more resources toward the show so like i'm in talks now like with the, our pr team i'm going to get dana white on and we're going to sit down face to face and uh and do it upright so uh um, oh, you know 
I want to get bigger and bigger guests. And, you know, I've had Bisping and Dom Cruz and, you know, I've had big guests on the show already, but um, I want to make, you know, big names and unique interviews, the mainstay. And I'm working uh, to make it like a studio thing where I can be sitting across from them instead of, you know, streaming uh, and doing it on Zoom or StreamYard or whatever virtual platform we're on. I want to get back to doing it like in person and kind of do it full Joe Rogan style where it's like in studio, great interviews, uh, talking a lot about a a lot of different things. So onward and upward. All right. Sounds good. Well, also, we'll be checking you out this Saturday for the craziness that this card is going to be. I truly think it's going to be like a little mini pay-per-view, especially being with a live crowd and truly all the fights that are on there. There's an interesting aspect to every single one of them. And I can't wait to hear you. Hopefully you get that bathroom break in. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Andy. Yeah, I mean, my job is to hold back <laughs> a little bit. I'm going to be so excited with the crowd. I'm going to try to not yell my voice out like four fights in and, and keep something in the tank for later. But uh, it's going to be a great night. That, that, we can, that we all know. Sounds good. Well, again, thank you for your time, man. Awesome, Andy. Good to talk to you, my man. Where are you? You're in North Carolina? North Carolina. Good old NC. Well, Salisbury is where? Salisbury, Salisbury, you're from where I'm at. I'm in Huntersville. So, so the main hub is Charlotte. So Huntersville is about 30 minutes away. And then Salisbury is about another 30 minutes away. Which direction is Huntersville? Huntersville from Charlotte. Charlotte. Oh, snap. So, um, Huntersville is going to be up north from Charlotte. Okay. I lived in Tiga K. When I worked at ESPN, I worked at ESPN U. Uh huh. And uh, our studio is in Ballantyne. Oh, okay. Yeah. My wife used to uh, live in Ballantyne. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, we, like, I lived in Tiga K on the, on the other side of the border, South Carolina, and uh, commuted into Ballantyne. And, yeah, we lived in Charlotte from 2014 to 2017. And then I got laid off by ESPN then. And so we moved out. And that's when the UFC job happened a few months later. So. Gotcha. Yeah, you were close to... I still got some friends in Charlotte. Nice. Yeah, you were living close by to Chris Wheatman. Or, I mean, maybe the time frame was different. Oh, Chris Wheatman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He... No, he... Yeah, we were not there at the same time. I had already been with the UFC for a couple years. But, yeah, he's in Fort Mill. Yeah. He's down there. Yeah. Yeah, but... I didn't know that he was... um, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I... I, Charlotte, I know, was in discussion for a, a UFC card. September, I think. I'm not sure if it's going to happen or not. Oh. But there's a chance that uh, Charlotte gets a UFC event in September. So be on the breaking lookout. news with Brendan Fitzgerald. Yeah, yeah I yeah, saw I that know, it was. I don't know, like it's just on the list of possible cities. Uh-huh. So it's not like, you know, so yeah, uh, yeah. I think that uh, that by card they were looking at like San Diego, Boston, all kinds, mm-hmm. Atlanta. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I can't wait. Hopefully, it's yeah, closer like to home. Like you know as much as I do. You know <laughs> Like I, I'm, I'm waiting to see where I'm going to go to next. We'll see August, uh, August 13th is that one that you know was maybe Boston, but now it looks like San Diego. Right. And then, uh, September. I was supposed to be on September 10th. Then yesterday, TJ and Aljo are supposed to fight in the pay per view on September 10th, which I had been told the pay per view might move to September 10th. So now I'm probably calling a show on September 17th. No idea where it is, but uh, it's part of the fun of the job. It's like a little like lottery like yeah where do i get to go keeps you on your toes i know i'm working on this one but where's it gonna be i'm gonna go see on the road you know so we'll see (laughs) man uh it's been great talking to you uh i did not know that you lived in charlotte for a little bit which is also cool um but yeah hopefully that show comes by and if you are talking to that show uh hopefully we'll see you there but yeah great chat thank you awesome andy thanks all the best good luck with this man keep going Thank you. Brandon Fitzgerald, everybody. Peace. Later, my man. Thank you. Bye.